Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on Innovation Nation. I have a very special person with me today, Carrie. Carrie, can you please introduce yourself? Hey, so yeah, I'm Carrie Getz. I have been in this industry for 40 years in some shape, form, or fashion. I've literally done about everything, starting from programming through running IT departments, consulting, running data centers. I've been in the industry long enough to have commissioned data centers that I later decommissioned. Wow. That's how long I've been around. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. And I'm excited because we're going to talk about a lot of that today. Um, in regards to your background, you know, you work with Strategic Com. And um, can you share with us a bit about what your company does and what they're about? So we just launched CTO as a service this year. Really kind of the premise behind that is that all companies deserve some technology help, technology direction, but maybe they don't have the time to literally, you know, have somebody 40 hours a week or, you know, maybe it's not in their budget. So it's really an as a service service. So they can have somebody come in a day a week, a day a month, kick off through a project. So we do a lot of strategic planning, technology planning, infrastructure design, that kind of stuff, and just really help companies embody what technology can do to advance their business purposes. That's amazing. So I'm happy that you shared that with us because that does lead me into my next question about the recent award that you received as one of the yeah. top influential you know, females in the industry. Can you share a bit around that award and what that, what that award was for? Uh, yeah, so it's the top 10, or well, not top 10, but the 10 most influential women in technology 2020, which I thought was a pretty great award. There's some other really amazing women on there. It's from Analytics Insight, but it really just uh, was kind of a recognition, I think, of a lot of things. So a lot of the outreach that I do for women in tech, um, I have a, my own podcast series for careers for women, trades, and vets in tech. And then also, you know, just... Um, I do a lot, uh, I write for a lot of different publications and really do a lot just to sort of shortcut and make technology accessible to a lot of different folks, so. Well, it yeah. couldn't be, well, congratulations, first of all. And, thank you, thank um, you. Even from the short amount of time that we've been hanging out, I feel like I've already learned a lot from you too. And I, uh, I think it's great because the topic I wanna talk about with you today is obviously around technology and innovation around it specifically analytics, AI, you know, how we're using machine learning and how we're staying at the edge with it and, and keeping ourselves very up to date when it comes to new technologies coming out with 40 years of experience, you know, with your background. One of the first questions I have for you is how do you typically stay up to date on technology and how do you decide when you do or don't want to invest in it? Oh, that's a good question. So I, I read a stupid amount. <laughs> um, I, I don't really listen to a lot of podcasts, although I do podcasts. That's probably horrible to say. Uh, but reading has been my thing because, you know, usually when you do a lot of travel and stuff, reading seems to be like one of the easiest ways to kind of go about getting that information. Uh, and as technology comes out, I really try to read all different sides, like the pros and cons, right? Mm -hmm. So AI is a good example. A lot of people are really worried that AI is going to take jobs. It's not, it's going to shift jobs, right? Somebody still has to program and, and write some of the methodology behind there. But also I think there's a social responsibility that goes with any of that AI, right? So we know, for instance, that AI 100% carries the bias of the coders. Mm -hmm. For people, we write what we know. It's not necessarily, you know, that, that it's intentional, but it happens. And so that's one of those areas I think where diversity really comes in play. And since that's a big outreach topic of mine, I really got pulled into the whole AI topic kind of that way and understanding. And I think there's a lot of things it can do for you. You know, there's um, uh, OpsRamp is a great company. So they do this AI that runs over a data center and over the servers and the stuff that as it learns what fixes a problem, it starts healing some of those problems itself. So it gets people out of the minutia of rebooting a server and gives them more time to be strategic and do the stuff, you know, the, the planning for a business that it should do. So I think there's some real cool benefits to it. But like I said, I, I also think there's some serious social responsibility that comes along with that. Can you expand a little bit on the social responsibility? Some of the things that you're seeing are common, um, especially around AI and, you know, this 
I feel like, especially in the security industry, you know, it's, I wouldn't say newer. I think AI has obviously been around for a long time, but it's becoming more common to see people take a risk, take a chance on that type of technology. So like when we talk about social, you know, constructs, maybe if you can share a little bit about how you either debunk them or, you know, communicate to the end user what they're getting and how to make them feel comfortable with the solution. You know, how do you go about that, especially when there's new things popping up all the time? Yeah, so take a take a smart city initiative, right? So if we decide that we're going to put in a traffic monitoring pattern at all of our bus stops, and we're going to figure out how many people are at certain bus stops at certain times of day so that we can be smarter about how we how we set up bus routes and what times of day they go and see which ones maybe we can skip and do different things. That's a very good purpose for AI, right? You agree. Now, mm -hmm. what if that gets in the wrong hands or the security's not there or somebody decides to do even more targeted things and we don't just look at the number of people, maybe now we start looking at gender makeup of people or maybe we start looking at ethnic makeup of people and we start making different decisions based on you know somebody has to code that right so so if somebody has this thought in their mind that certain things happen around certain ethnic um, groups obviously that would be a socially horrible thing to do with AI right. and so I think that responsibility comes to make sure that whatever we're really examining and learning with AI that it's vetted. It's vetted across, um, you know, genders. It's vetted across racial groups. It's vetted, you know, any time that there's some decision being made based on any of those categories, that it's that it's fully vetted to make sure that it does the right thing, right? Right. And so, really, I mean, actually, maybe we should take it a step back, right? Because we're talking about coding and we're talking about AI as like a term. Can you help just define in the simplest terms what AI is and how it works and how we would potentially implement it into an environment? Uh, well, it could be a lot of things, right? So that traffic was a good example. Yeah. So if we're going to you know, look at the number of people and decide when we're going to put buses in there, if we're going to do things like um, look for behavior in the security world, mm -hmm. take an underground so I was in the London Underground two days before it blew up. And yeah, I know, dicey, right? Oh. Um, I was also in, in Indonesia the day after that hotel blew up. So <laughs> sometimes international travel is crazy. But wow. anyway, they were able to find that guy super fast because they, in, in London at the time, the average American was filmed more in a day than they are in two years in the United States because they have cameras everywhere. And so when they decided to start looking for things, they were using AI on top of security footage to single out things like backpacks or backpacks left and, you know, things like that, that they could pick out. So that's, that's certainly one example. Um, the example with the servers is another one, you know, as these things learn that, yeah, you know, when a server locks up, you need to go reboot it. So now let's use the intelligence and let, let the machine you know, reboot itself or let's let the power strip cycle. So it, it warm, you know, forces a reboot. There's a lot of those kind of things where it's really just examining repetitive things and figuring out what to do with that. And, you know, I was in a, um, I was on a panel with a distinguished engineer from Microsoft a long time ago. And he said that they were doing, they did a study of car lots in the United States. Um, and this, this was over in Britain, actually. Um, and they were doing a study of the United States and they decided that in order for a car lot to be successful, the AI that they ran over all of their big data said that the car lot had to sell orange cars. And I said, because there's like eight orange cars in the US to start with, I think. I mean, it's not, definitely not the most popular color car and he said, well, that's just it. You know, you're not supposed to question the intelligence that comes at the end of this. You're just supposed to take it at face value. And that's where I think the social responsibility comes in because what if every car lot in the U.S. went out and started buying orange cars based off that intelligence? Mm -hmm. It would be non-actionable. So I think it needs to be tested and I think it needs to be vetted. Yeah, I love that. And you're using 
you bring up a concept that I did want to talk about where, you know, actionable data, right? Using, when we're using artificial intelligence to help us understand potentially an environment, or maybe we're authenticating somebody or, you know, facial recognition, everybody's favorite, you know, topic to be, to discuss whether you're, a, you know, a fan of it and you believe in it or you are scared of it. Right. And especially from a social responsibility standpoint, um, it's interesting because when you think about artificial intelligence and data and what we're gathering from the environment, it really comes back to an end user, right? Like, are we able to create an action? How do we make operational efficiencies better for the end users? How can, like you said, in London, they found the person in a day. I mean, that is massive, right? Like that's somewhere okay. where we would find great benefit by using that type of AI and analytics and gathering data to make a decision. But then you have the whole other side of it where nowadays think, I mean, I don't want to get too trivial here, but like when you think about all the apps and like TikTok and Snapchat and all these things that exist, right? You're using like AI is around us all the time. We just don't even realize it. Well, that's the scary part. So if you take some of those apps, right? Right. And those apps have a picture of your face. They now have the ability to act on that data. And those images get scraped off the internet in a ridiculous speed. And there are companies out there that that's the intelligence that they have is your face. So now they know racial makeups of cities because they have the geo codes of where you were in your, on your phone. They have, you know, there's all kinds of things that you add to that. Matter of fact, the whole thing with TikTok right now, I was reading today that the Chinese government is going to ban any artificial intelligence leaving China, which is probably going to stop Microsoft and Walmart or Oracle or whoever was going to buy TikTok that might put you know, a, a hitch in the system. But the point is, you know, people are so free with their data. And, and anybody that thinks they have a shred of privacy these days is pretty ridiculous. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it just doesn't because there's too much convenience and we all take advantage of that convenience. But by the same token, we all have to be responsible with the data that we put out there too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't answer these, what is your birth month? <laughs> quizzes on on social media and those kind of things you know tell us what month you were born and we'll tell you something about yourself or you know all those kind of things and then I think there's also if you go one past that think of um, these health devices that everybody wears on their wrist so there's a company out there now that knows all of your web browsing habits and they know all of your health information and a lot of that is tied to company medical plans so the amount of information now that's getting amassed is pretty huge. But back to your point about actionable data, that's important with any data, right? You have to, if you try to find a needle in the haystack, you have to first make sure you're at the right haystack that contains the needle. And it's like that with any amount of data. The only good data is data that you'll use. The rest of it is noise. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to filter through the noise. And I think that's where AI comes into play and helps a little bit is getting some of the noise and getting it down to something that's vetably actionable. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. And I have a question about around your experience and over the years, you know, you, you know, AI obviously hasn't existed for the entire time of you working within physical security. And I'm curious if you remember like when you first started hearing about it and like what that felt like, um, because, for me, at least being in the industry only about five years now, I'm growing my career, obviously, and I'm coming in when all this is standard, right? Like I didn't, I haven't been here to like go over a hump of like what it used to be and what it should be or where it's going. Like, this is just like, I work at an AI company, right? Like that's what we do. It wasn't like I got to ask the question of like, are we sure we want to do this? Right, right. <laughs> you know, like, I'm curious, like from your perspective, because you also are, as you know, like one of the most influential leaders in tech. Like, what was that like for you when you were first starting to hear about the technology coming out? So I think, you know, for me, the internet wasn't even what it is today when I started in this industry. Um, 
connectivity was very different. I started in networking when nobody even knew how to do it. We literally took sneakers from one computer to another and the internet as it is today was somebody's test lab. And so, yeah, very, very different. But AI, I think probably the first exposure was out of sci-fi and somebody's thoughts about what could happen. There's, um, there's a movie called The Minority Report, which is probably a great example of AI, mm -hmm. right? The character walks into a store, welcome so-and-so, last week you bought this shirt in blue, would you like to buy it in red or yellow or whatever, you know, and, and it knows your habits and learns your habits. And then over the years, we're getting a lot closer to that. We're getting freakishly closer to that. And so, yeah, I think that, um, yeah, there's been a lot of things really in tech that have started out as a concept in somebody's wonderful imagination in science fiction that now is more science than fiction. Computer so, science to be exact. <laughs> it's so interesting you're saying. It's so cool. It's like such a, it's so real though. Like I, you know, one of the examples I use, which is a really simple example, but if you think about when you like look at the movies and you walk into the spaceship and the door just opens for you and it knows you're approaching the door and like you don't touch a thing and I'm not trying to bring this back to what I do today but because I like to keep this agnostic but I've been describing a lot of those experiences as like spaceship status like when you're taking it to that next level that we've always imagined but like didn't actually think we could do and then you find that you're, you're at the day where you can actually do it it's kind of just mind-blowing like in front of an example is, you know, in the Warriors arena where in my past company, we worked with the, um, we did the security integration for that opportunity. And one of the things that they came to us about was like, hey, we don't want the players to like touch anything when they're leaving the court. We just want them to walk to the door, to their locker room, door unlocks, no need to stop the workflow, right? I don't believe that that is an ask that would have come up eight years ago, 10 years yeah. ago, people, yeah. don't, you wouldn't have thought about that. You know what yeah. I mean? And nowadays we're at this point with technology where you can ask something that may seem very unattainable in which it actually is very attainable. Well, that's kind of the way it works, right? A technology yeah. RFID tags are, are a good example of that, right? RFID tag comes out, they decide they're going to use it for inventory. And then it's like, well, what else could we do with it? You can actually have it implanted in your hand and you can unlock your door which kind of begs the question, how close are you with somebody before you say, hey, babe, will you get a microchip for me? <laughs> That's but, you scary. Know, you get that, right? But, and then what happens if you break up? Do you, do you pull it out or you just kill his code? But, um, <laughs> but the whole, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. There's, there's bracelets now where you walk into a room, it'll set your lighting, it can set your mu music preference. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is appear and then it takes care of things for you. So, um, and then, you know, the other, all the other sensor technology that goes along with that, look at smart buildings right now, you know, shades know to shut themselves when it gets certain temperature, the lights, you know, maintain different temperatures. And then, because now that we know sensors are there, we can tell how many people are in a room. So we can tell the cleaning crew, don't go clean that room. Let's save on that electricity, you know, and, and not mm -hmm. run vacuums where there's no need to run one. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, it is very much a progressive thing. And I think to me, the coolest thing about tech and the thing that I've always loved about tech is that it's such an imagination world because if you imagine it, it can happen. Wow. And it, you know, there's somebody out there, like I can't imagine a day in Elon Musk's brain. <laughs> <laughs> and my brain, per my up. brain turns really, really fast as it is. Yeah. So that would probably make mine explode. But, um, but it is, you know, honestly, if you, if you dream about it, there's somebody out there with the vision and drive to make it happen. And then one thing piggybacks on another and it just gets a little bit better and a little bit better. I mean, I grew up watching the Jetsons. You probably don't even know who they are, but. I watched um, the Jetsons. Oh, did you watch the Jetsons? Show. Yeah, they were like so, the futuristic. Yeah, thing. yeah. <laughs> but look how much of that is true today, right? That was a cartoon. <laughs> And now, you know, we have robots that vacuum your floor. It's not Rosie. She doesn't talk back and, and you know, feed your kids for you, but that's probably next, right? It's so, yeah, a lot of those kind of cool things. They have robotic uh, ironing things where you feed it in pants and it irons your shirt. I don't have one of those yet, but. 
I'm I, sure we will very soon. <laughs> no, I mean, they make them now. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting too, because you bring up Elon Musk and I was, I just read an article yesterday on some, basically a technology where he's going to start some human trials, but utilizing, um, basically for brain, brain, um, disease or, or, you know, neurological diseases, utilizing AI and like tech to help somebody like cure their whatever disease they may have that's related to your brain. And they're going into, hu I didn't read too much in the article. Honestly, I kind of, it kind of freaked me out. Cause I was like, now what is Elon going to do? Another thing, right? Like <laughs> another thing that this guy uh, come out with. Is like, amazing. Yeah. He's, he is but, so amazing. But he's, think about somebody with a traumatic spinal cord injury. Yeah. If your if your brain can make it work, you can literally control a robot to make yourself walk. It's I mean, it's honestly it, it it could cure well not really cure but you know it could provide a mechanism for a lot of people to have a better quality of life than what they have today. Yes. Um, you know and and we already know that neurons fire that way and and we know a lot about brain but there's a lot that we don't know and I think even that's an opportunity as we start studying it more and start studying the interaction, what else we don't know about the human brain. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting and miss it's, um, it's for me, it's very mystical almost in a sense. It seems like, and I think of like Westworld is what comes to mind when I think about what Elon Musk might start doing or that new path he's going to pave in the industry or in this world of technology, you know, like really utilizing robotics and AI to to help humans be strong again, right? Or like if again, you think about the social implications there, right? What happens when you've got that thing in your brain? Does it know all of your thoughts? And I don't are you know. judged on those thoughts, right? right? So, you know, that's another area where when we talk about social responsibility for this information, that's a lot of information there, right? Mm -hmm. So um and you know, people think I could just kill him, right? We've all said that at some point, just out of anger. But if that's a written thought, and do we act on that and think, oh my God, he's really going to kill that person? Or do we know to just sort of blow that off and say, well, you know, and, and see, that's the part that AI will never be able to do. No. And that I think is what people fail to realize with AI is that it is a level of intelligence, but it's not interpretive intelligence, meaning that it doesn't have that human ability to read into a situation. We'll always have to have humans next to AI. It's just not there yet. And right. people are so different. Personalities are different. Thought processes are different. I mean, just look at emails. How many times have you read something in email and thought, oh, that was pretty awful? <laughs> Only to realize somebody just wrote that in a hurry. You know, right, or, or right, right. people that do one word responses to emails. Right. Wow, is he mad at me? That's it's the, the part AI can't do. Yeah. It's the emotion. It's it's something important to think about also that as we do implement new technology, like we have to be realistic with what we are expecting of it, right? Like it's not always gonna be the end all be all. As oh, innovative no. as we wanna be. Yeah. You know. Well, and there's all there's always going to be people that don't adopt it too, right? Look how many people get a flu shot. Not a lot, right? I but the technology is there if people want to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, it's very interesting. I mean, especially with our climate today and like where this society is going. And I think, you know, there's a lot of social constructs right now around AI and around facial rec and around technology as a whole and then you have the whole political side to it i mean it's a challenging time to try and be at the forefront with it because i think a lot of people are looking down upon what we're doing when it comes to ai and like how we're utilizing that to create the actual data make better decisions in the environment with the right intention right and like sure. you have to you still need a human to vet and decide what's our intention, right? Like, how are we using it? What are we doing with it? The, and for time breakers. Exactly. Wrong. Right, right. So, I mean, I just, I think it's a really interesting topic and I wanted to bring you on, Carrie, to talk about it because you're at the front lines with this 
Really quickly, I want to ask another question before we end, because I don't want to go over with time, but I want to ask you about specifically with data centers, because you mentioned how you're utilizing some AI with troubleshooting, like in a self-healing environment for it to know how to like respond to an issue um, within that type of environment from, from a security perspective. Are you seeing data centers use AI in that type of uh, technology as well? Sure. I mean, just just from an access standpoint, who can come into the data center uh, yeah. is definitely a big part of it. I think that another really big part of that is from a sustainability. So if you look at software defined power and being able to orchestrate moves around a data center and make sure that you have the most energy efficient or, or to be able to just shift it over to a micro grid mm -hmm. when peak energy costs are high and, and some of that reactive stuff is definitely huge. But yeah, from a security standpoint, you know, irises and, and that stuff for one thing, but now people don't want to touch anything mm -hmm. because of COVID, right? So something has to do that, that vetting and recognition and things like, you know, is somebody coming in this data center 20 pounds heavier than they were than they, when they left? And if so, who do we call? Because they're obviously bringing something in or, or vice versa. They're bringing something out that maybe they shouldn't be. And so I think that um, you know, we can set up triggers and we can figure out different things like that. But uh, certainly that's, you know, that's all part of the AI is trying to, to me, I guess probably the, the best um, description for AI is getting rid of stupid human tricks. Yes. Yes. Because that is the lowest hanging fruit, right? Yes. And we're all human and we all do stupid stuff. But if you could get rid of the stupid human tricks, <laughs> now we can move on to bigger and better things. Yes. And so I think AI is a perfect vehicle for getting rid of stupid human tricks. I love that. That is so spot on. That's a great place for us to at least end on this specific topic. And I'm going to, I want to bring you back again for a part B so we can talk oh, about technology. But I think you make a really good point. Like it's a nice ending point. Like we're, we're not utilizing it to replace a human, right? or to eliminate humans, but we're making, we're using it to honestly make ourselves make us better, right? Like absolutely use it with the right morals and the right intentions. Yep. Yep. You know? Absolutely. So I want to thank you so much, Carrie, for bringing up this oh, topic yeah, and talking with me. And for those of you who want to meet Carrie, please follow or connect with her on LinkedIn. We will put her link in the info and definitely read up on a lot of Carrie's, um, you know, articles out there and what she's done and, and her recent award. I mean, she's an amazing thought leader and I'm very honored Carrie to have you here with oh, me. Thanks. Today. It was a pleasure. Thanks Thank for having you me. so much. It was great having you. Thanks. Thanks.